Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got the live streaming working. Um, welcome everybody to another semester of the Nanoit Tech seminars. Um, this is our first one for the fall 2023 semester, so it's a real uh, pleasure to have our invited speaker here. Uh, before I introduce him, um, just a word about the next seminar. Uh, which will be in three weeks on uh, September tw uh, 12th, and the speaker will be uh, Professor Alex Abramson from Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Um, so it's a real pleasure, as I said, to have uh, Wei Gao here with us. We actually um, had him give one of these lectures uh, just about a little, little less than three years ago. If you remember where you were three years ago, uh, you were probably at home, <laughs> uh, as everybody was. Um, so it was a Zoomed uh, uh, seminar, so it's, it's nice to have everybody back in person again. Um, uh, Professor Gao is, uh, got his bachelor's degree from uh, Hua Zong University of Science and Technology uh, in, in uh, mechanical engineering, and then a master's degree at uh, Tsinghua, before getting his PhD at UC San Diego in chemical engineering, and then doing a postdoc at UC Berkeley in uh, double E and computer science. Uh, at, since 2017, uh, he's been at Caltech, where he is currently assistant professor of medical engineering. Um, he also ha holds numerous editorial roles, including as an associate editor at Science Advances. Um, his list of accomplishments and awards is very long. I won't read it, um, but notably an NSF Career Award winner, a Sloan Fellowship, uh, MIT Technology Review 35 under 35, uh, and you get the get the idea. So it's a it's a real pleasure to have you with us. I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, also thanks for, for the wonderful opportunity to visit uh, Georgia Tech in person. It's actually my first time visit uh, Atlanta. So it's wonderful to have this opportunity to discuss our recent research on skin interface wearable biosensors. So uh, I'm currently assistant professor of medical engineering. Medical engineering is a relatively new department at Caltech focusing on translational research. My group right now have around 30 to 35 PhD and postdocs, mostly focused on developing bioelectronic devices for different types of applications, this including sensors for continuous health monitoring, a micro nano robot for drug delivery, and uh, also some other applications such as human machine interaction. Today, I will mainly focus on our main research topic, wearable biosensors. We know wearables can play an important role in personalized healthcare because it can continuously collect data from our body and tell us what's going on and what's going wrong with our house. But if you look at all these commercially available house monitors like Apple Watch or Fitbit, they can mainly track the physical activities or vital signs, but cannot provide the more useful information about our health at the molecule level. So we think a major gap, which is also a great opportunity in the field of wearable sensors, how can we perform physiological monitoring at molecule level, ideally continuously and non-invasively. Thinking of non-invasive chemical sensing, we know there's one product, continuous glucose monitor, CGM, which already changed the world. Very important, but that's only one probably, the well-known one. So thinking of non-invasive healthcare, we are looking at one important body fluid, human sweat. We are essentially sweating all the time. At a time at Georgia, I feel I'm sweating all the time, regardless if I stay outside. Sweat contains many important biomarkers or analytes. It contains many different types of electrolytes, metabolites, over 30 amino acids, many other nutrients such as vitamins, 300 proteins, over 300, and many other vitamins, uh, I mean, hormone, peptides, and substances such as heavy metals and drugs. Imagine that if we could develop a wearable system, like the time when we wear this Apple Watch or Fitbit, we could continuously collect this chemical information from our daily activities. This large set of chemical and molecular information are previously not accessible. If we use this coupled with AI, with machine learning, we will be able to 
enable numerous fundamental clinical investigations. So especially toward preventive care and biomarker discovery. So back to seven and a half years ago, I published my first paper in this field. and We presented a fully integrated wearable sensor that can perform real-time multiplex sensing of glucose, lactate, sodium, potassium, as well as the skin temperature. So this is a wireless system that can perform on-site signal conditioning, processing, and wireless transmission. So eventually all the data from the sensor will be sent to the phone through Bluetooth and displayed on a customer developed cell phone app. So from this, we can you know, save the data to the uh, uh, cell phone or send the data uh, to the computer through email or upload data to the cloud. So this paper has been cited over 3,700 times already over the past six and a half years. That means many people are working in this field now. Numerous progress have been made to push uh, this field further. But again, despite all many progress, there are still major challenges remaining to realize the full potential of full, really practical application of these wearable biosensors. I listed here. But of course, these are not the only five. These, I think, are the five remaining important ones we have to address. And it's also our lab's research focus over the past six years. Firstly, chemical sensors, they don't work like a pacemaker for 10 years, you can use one sensor. So usually it's disposable. Even CGM, continuous glucose monitor, two weeks, you have to replace the needle. So the sensors need to be disposable. In this case, we need to mass produce this high performance sensor at low cost. People typically use nanomaterial to modify electrode, again, manual modification, huge sensor variation. We need a mass-produced high-performance sensor using a scalable manufacturing approach. And secondly, since we are talking about sweat sensor, as I said, hot weather like today or outside, you don't need a, any other approach to get sweat. But again, for real practical applications on the patients, indoor, how can we get a sweat without need for any vigorous exercise or extreme weather? So can we monitor our house during uh, when we are doing office work or even during sleep? So how can we get a sweat across the activity? How can we sample a sweat efficiently, analyzing fresh sweat all the time and with the miniaturized influence from evaporation or skin contamination? Basically, high accuracy, real time sweat sensing is very important here. Third one is that there are so many biomarkers. Clinically relevant biomarkers are usually present in our body fluid at very low concentration and very hard to monitor in situ. So we need new sensing strategies. And the fourth one is that we need a valid data sensor in different type of populations for disease prevention and management. Basically, we need a killer application. We need to show they are useful. So last but not least, a sustainable opera wearable operation need a low power or cell power system in general. How can I realize cell powered or even better free wearable electronics through energy harvesting is also one important topic. So in the following slides, I will try to address all these challenges using our uh, lab's current and ongoing, uh, I mean past works in general, but not fully addressing. We are still on the way, part by part. Firstly, to get mass producible sensor at la uh, larger scale low cost, we introduced this laser engraved lab on the skin. Basically, we are using CO2 laser engraving to patent grade film sensors on the surface of plastic. Basically, CO2 laser can create the graphene on the surface of plastic through a photothermal process. You can just think of this more like a laser burning the surface of plastic and cause a localized carbonization. You don't need any other chemicals to fabricate this graphene structure. This beautiful graphene can be controlled and fabricated by controlled laser parameter and, uh, and in general, like a substract and the reacting time. So by controlled laser parameter or condition, we can make graphene structures that are suitable for chemical sensing, very good performance. We can also make graphene structures that are good for physical sensing to monitor vital signs and res such as respiration and heart rate. So we can also use the laser to pattern microfluidics just use laser to cut uh, the medical adhesive, uh, or poly, uh, like a PET, for example. So in overall, this multimodal physical chemical sensing microfluidic sensor patch can be entirely prepared using CO2 laser covered with some plastics. You can imagine it could be very low cost and mass produceable in this case. And this laser engraved graphene has a very good performance to detect chemicals in human sweat, for example. We can directly get 
uh, oxidation peak of uric acid, tyrosine, using Bayer graphene electrode without any surface modification. But if you use other commercially available electrodes, such as glass and carbon, gold electrode, or screen print electrode, you cannot see distinct peaks. That means these sensors or electrodes are very sensitive to monitor very low concentration biomarkers in human body fluid. This is about laser engraving. We can also use other printing technology, for example, inject printing, to fabricate these multimodal biosensors. So we can customize our own inks. We can prepare our inks based on silver nanoparticle, carbon, gold, CNT, graphene oxides, silver nanowire, morph, mixing, and encapsulation layer. So all this material, we can program our printer to print different material at different locations. And you know that different material can be preferred for different type of sensing applications. We can print, in this case, very diverse sensors on the same page. And this can be used for human-machine interaction for this work. Of course, can, similar approach can be used to print multimodal physical chemical sensing electronic skin or wearable sensor. This is our second approach we are using for mass produce these biosensors. Next challenge we try to address, how can we get a sweat without need of exercise? I already explained the, the motivation. So we learned from the literature that there is a process called iontophoresis that can be used to locally induce sweat without need for exercise. So in the clinical setting, the doctors use this small equipment. They use this process to extract sweat locally from a newborn for cystic fibrosis diagnosis. So actually, CF is a common lung, genetic lung disease. Many US newborn will get sweat test screening. The gold standard for CF diagnosis is based on sweat chloride. So doctors use this equipment Applies the pair of electrodes on the skin, uh, you know, through applied current and possibly charged drug, pyrocarbon, will be delivered below the skin. This drug will bond to muscanic receptor that stimulate the sweat gland to cause local sweating. Then doctors use this microdata sweat collector to collect sweat. So inspired by this process, we are thinking, can we make our own sweat induction module in our wearable system? So first we need to understand how this work, how this process work in general. And we need to learn how, why sweat, why, why we are sweating, how we are sweating in general. For thermal regularity of sweating, the reason for, uh, for sweating is because the somatic neuron below the skin, near the sweat gland, is secreting acetylcholine, the neuron transmitter for them, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will bind to the muscanic receptor that will control the ion transport, basically pumping the water out. This is our, how biologic, you know, from physiology point of view, we are sweating. So in this case, what if we can locally introduce the drugs or neuron transmitters such as acetylcholine through transdermal drug delivery, this is pyrocarbon essentially, instead of letting our neuron to secrete this acetylcholine neuron transmitter. So it will work the same way. Locally delivered molecule will be bonding to the muscanic receptor and control the ion channel uh, in general to cause the local sweating. It's essentially the same physiological process. Based on this, we develop our newer platform. It is an integrated system with a miniaturized iontophoresis module inside. So instead of, uh, compared to the commercial product, you, you still need to apply roughly one to 1.5 milliampere, which is on the infants, you know, it's pretty safe. That's why people are doing it on the newborns. Again, 1.5 milliampere, kind of, you can already feel tingling. It's troublesome if you do this on a uh, wearable platform. That will induce sweat for less than one hour. It's again, we want long-term monitoring. Can we monitor our health 24 seven? That's why we are introducing here a newer platform based on our laser engraved electrode. We are delivering only five minutes with a very small current, 50 to 100 microampere deliver a drug called carbacol. This is a clinic agent with a muscanic uh, like a, a effect as well. They can bind to receptor, triggering long lasting sweat. This small current, the user will not feel anything. And you will get local sweat for at least five, six hours to several days. This is only one simulation. You can easily start the simulation again because everything is integrated to the disposable patch. So, as I said, a few minutes simulation, then stop simulation. You don't need to do anything. The sweat gland will automatically secrete the sweat. You see, we use the black dye to show the old sweat get pushed out by new sweat. You always get fresh sweat flow into the microfluidics. Our sweat gland is a natural pump. 
So automatically refresh the old one. Our sensor is sitting inside the middle reservoir to analyze a fresh sweat all the time. This, for me, with this five simulation, five minutes, locally I will sweat for two days. So you don't even feel you are sweating. Only when you put your finger here, you feel, oh, maybe here is moisture, it's wet. If you have the microfluidic, it continues to work. This really address a problem, how to get uh, sweat out all the time, sustainably in a controllable way, and we can analyze our chemical information over time, potentially 24 seven. So our lab, we do a lot of system integration. We wanna make sure we can reliably collect data because data is always the most important goal for the wearable sensor. With data, we can talk about application. If we don't trust data, there's no application. So we have different type of wireless prototype developed. We can package our system into a wristband, headband, a smart bandage-like device, or patch even a ring. We can have different version to do the localized stimulation, so sampling and wireless sensing. We have uh, developed different type of cell phone app. We have iOS app, we have uh, Android app. The users could come to our lab, we can give the phone, they can wear our device, collect data, eventually they return the phone, return the device, so we can collect data in the end. So this really opened the door for many uh, biomedical applications. In the following slides, I will briefly show you some applications. The first one is disease diagnosis, as I showed earlier. Cystic fibrosis. Sweat test is the gold standard for diagnosing cystic fibrosis, essentially based on sweat chloride. So collaboration, in collaboration with Stanford School of Medicine, Cystic Fibrosis Center, we applied our device on healthy people and on the safe patients. You see that for the healthy people, instead of clinical setting, people use endophoresis, get a sweat, collect sweat, send out the sweat for a lab. For lab tests in general, will take a week. We can get a, real time on body monitoring within 20 to 25 minutes, reliable sensing of sweat, sodium chloride. If you see healthy people, their sodium chloride level below 20 millimolar. But for the CF patients, their sodium chloride level are much higher, higher than 60. This is statistical information. And we can say that our device can be used for screening and diagnosing CF, especially considering for adults, CF diagnosis is based on sweat chloride higher than 60 millimolar. So this is the first uh, very classic application. And right now we are working on a lot of more applications. One of the main focus is the cardiometabolic disorders. Look at the metabolic disorder, we started with a very common disease, it's actually gout. Gout is the most common inflammatory arthritis affecting tens of million people around the world. My brother has gout as well. So gout is characterized by hyperuricemia. Basically, uh, for the patients, it's quite painful for them to, if they would like it eat red meat, shellfish, or drinking beer, because too much pure intake will trigger high uric acid level. Uric acid will crystallize near the joint, which will trigger tremendous pain for the patients. So there's no good cure for gout. So the patient, uh, usually the gout is developed either because of the lifestyle or because of the genetic reason. So monitor uric acid is very helpful for healthy people, maintain healthy lifestyle, minimize chance for developing gout. For the gout patients, it's very helpful for them to, to reduce the chance to get a flare up or gout attack. For the patients, you know, 90% of the gout management, gout management patients will take allopurinol, this drug, to lower uric acid level, which is like you know, insulin to lower glucose level. So, Monitor uric acid could be very helpful for them to personalize the drug dose, how much drug you should take to control uric acid level in a healthy range. Applying our microfluidic laser engraved sensor, uric acid sensor, we tested this device on healthy people, male and female subjects, you see that after overnight fasting, sweat and serum uric acid both are pretty low. After pure and rich diet intake, Uric acid level increased in both sweat and serum in all subjects, indicating the sensors you know, can get non-invasive uric acid change. In collaboration with Dr. Zhao Ping Li, uh, we, uh, she's the chief of clinical nutrition at the UCLA Medical Center. We recruited the patient with the gout, subject with hyperuricemia, along with the healthy subject. You see that for the patient with the gout, their uric acid level in sweat and serum are both very, very high compared to healthy people. If we track one subject over seven hours, we see sweat uric acid follow very closely to the serum one. That means 
sweat follow theorem very closely, have good correlation. If we put a correlation uh, a curve here, uh, combining simply combining all our data, we get a correlation factor of 0.864. This is without uh, personalized calibration. Just simply put that together. Its correlation is pretty good already. That means that, you know, really there is high potential to use sweat uric acid as a biomarker for gout management. Right now, we have a clinical trial going on supported by NIDDK to recruit a few hundred gout patients to see if this technology can be used to improve gout management. Of course, what we are trying to do with metabolic disorder, we're not limited to uric acid. Uric acid is a good one, but we have many other important circulating metabolites and nutrients which play an important role in our body function. For example, amino acids. We know there are nine essential amino acids. They are called the essential amino acids, of course, because they are important. They are essential to our body function. So how to monitor this? Monitor this will be very important to personalize the nutrition status. It's play an important role for precision nutrition. Now, and I should emphasize a lot for precision nutrition, especially given the impact of COVID. So to monitor circulating amino acid, the vitamins will be very important. But again, there is no good way. Only a few markers you could monitor using a sensor, such as enzymatic sensor continuously. Majority of these targets are not detectable in situ or continuously. So uh, to address this challenge, we are introducing a new sensing strategy it's based, based on molecular imprinted polymer. We couple the molecular imprinted polymer with our laser engraved graphene. One gives us selectivity, one gives us sensitivity. So how does molecular imprinted polymer work? So essentially, from monomer, we polymerize. We, we basically make this polymer in the presence of the target molecule. During this process, the target molecule will be trapped inside the polymer. After we remove the target molecule, then the polymer will have the cavities left. The cavities will have the same shape and size as the target molecule. So that will work as an artificial antibody that can recognize the target molecule again. So you know, antibody recognize protein because of the shape recognition as well. This is a very similar way. Uh, so this gives us selectivity to the bond to the specific molecule and how to transform this selective bond into variable signal. So we introduce a redox nanoparticle film between the polymer and the graphene layer. So the target bond to the protein, uh, bond to the polymer, will block the pathway of electrolyte to the redox probe. This will impact our electrochemical signal of the redox probe. By quantifying the redox probe signal size, we can get the target molecule information. So this is a new approach that allow us to monitor every single type of essential amino acid continuously, and many different type of vitamins, including vitamin C, B, D, E, you know, many different types, including lipids. So this could really could change the game for precision nutrition because it allows us to monitor many different types of nutrients simultaneously using wearable sensor in our daily activity. So, so for example, we can monitor our different type of supplement intake, we can see the real time the supplement or uh, this amino acid body in our body, uh, uh, amino acid intake, change our body amino acid level over time. Using branched chain amino acid as an example, these are three amino acid essential ones. They play a very important role. People are saying, actually, a lot of literature shows that this BCAA levels is predictive of insulin resistance. So basically, their levels could predict or give us early warning of insulin resistance. So we actually f identified a good correlation between sweat and blood uh, BCA level. We also did obesity subject, obesity and type 2 uh, diabetes subject. We see that increased uh, loosening of BCA levels in the obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes subjects. Overall, we can continuously track the nutrition level, BCA level, on the people at risk for developing pre-diabetes in this case. So again, molecule printed polymer is attractive, but it's not easy to develop. Usually we need to uh, involve, you know, select a monomer, select a cross-linker to prepare the polymer with good uh, selectivity to the target molecule. It usually require a lot of laboratory work to find the best combination of choices of polymer and uh, monomer, uh, monomer and cross-linker. And recently we reported a new computationally assisted approach, we call it quantum dock. This approach utilizes molecule docking, basically helping us identify the bonding site, and uh, using density function theory to calculate the bonding energy between the monomer, cross-linker, and target molecules. Basically, 
if the monomer cross-linker have the higher bonding energy, that means they potentially could have higher sensitivity. And we also try to calculate the bonding energy difference between, okay, monomer target and the monomer interference molecules. The bigger difference between on a uh, bonding energy to the target and to the interference molecules, that means potentially higher selectivity. This is the automatic approach, computational approach, allow us to accelerate the choice selection or optimization of this molecule print polymer. So based on this, we can uh, identify the good choice, ideal choice for particular target to design this artificial bioreceptor more scientifically. And we also validated this approach using different ways, using like UVVs based on nanoparticle absorption, also based on electrochemical sensing. We also demonstrated that we can develop a highly sensitive and selective finite energy sensor for PKU monitoring. Another next application I want to briefly talk is one of our lab main focus as well, how to apply wearables for stress and mental health monitoring. As we know, stress, is impacting many different health conditions. Over 95% of diseases are stress-related, including anxiety, depression, PTSD, CVD, and cancers. Even stress is so important, it's very hard to monitor. There are different type of questionnaires. These are gold standard. Basically, the user will answer a bunch of questions based on the answers, a score generated. You can imagine, this could be very subjective. So mental health, including depression, the same. Depression is diagnosed based on PHQ-9 questionnaire. Even suicide is also based on questionnaire. My psychologist collaborator was joking with me, if a person wants to commit suicide, will this person tell the truth, even you give the person a questionnaire. Similar situation in the pain, pain management. Pain is also based on scales, questionnaires. You can imagine different person's tolerance to the same pain may be different also. The answer will be highly subjective. So we are trying to build a scale can we quantify stress or quantify mental health conditions? So firstly, we are looking at what are the important biomarkers to monitor mental health. We know there's heart rate, blood pressure, pulse valve form, a lot of vital signs have been explored. But again, they are often not condition specific. So we are trying, can we, in addition to the vital sign, we're not trying to replace the vital signs. In addition to the vital sign, can we have chemical or molecular information to give us more comprehensive pictures about the body's stress response, for example. Cortisol is the most well-known stress hormone in our body. People know that everybody admits cortisol is a good stress biomarker, but it's hard to quantify. People try to draw blood to monitor cortisol, but the blood joy itself is questionable because blood joy itself gives people stress. When you try to monitor the stress by creating more stress, that's troublesome. So that's why non-invasive cortisol monitoring is highly important. So we were the first one to explore can we see sweat cortisol? Does sweat cortisol follow circadian rhythm? Because the cortisol has important feature, circadian rhythm. Every morning, our cortisol level is high, evening is low, every day like this. So not only you need to know cortisol level, you also need to know the baseline. So that's why uh, we did a lot of study. We, did, we use our laser engraved sensor based on antibody. It's actually one point of measurement. We quantify cortisol pretty efficiently. Within one to one and a half minutes, we can get accurate response to sweat cortisol level and validated our technology with ELISA, the gold standard. We identified the circadian rhythm in cortisol. We see every morning you see cortisol level is high, even is low. Similar pattern for sweat cortisol, saliva cortisol, and serum cortisol level. And the correlation we get is also 0.87, pretty high already. And uh, if we track one subject, we can get circadian rhythm continuously for seven days. And we also try the different type of human studies, give our subject a stress, using apply different stressors, for example, let our students do exercise. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say our students, because our, our IRB, this is the only, only IRB, when our Caltech IRB committee approved, said do not recruit students at Caltech. So <laughs> that's the only protocol, not, uh, Caltech students not allowed <laughs> as subjects. So, we did a vigorous exercise to induce stress. You can see the cortisol level during exercise increased pretty quickly. And we also did a colder pressure test. Uh, so basically put a hand into ice water, you will feel a lot of pain. Actually this pain gives people a lot of stress. You can also see it rapidly increase uh, of the cortisol level. I was the first subject in, this, uh, in our lab to do this work. When I put my hand into ice water, I feel a lot of pain. When I, when I look at, uh, when I, like, you know, 
I realized at that time, all my lab members are looking at me, staring at me, making it even feel more embarrassing and stressful. Then I realized why all they are looking at me, because they, everyone put a dollar, they just bet how long I can keep my hand in ice water. So it was a good experience. I, I could not bring my hand out, because if I do that, nobody wants to do the study. So it was a good trial, and we found uh, also rapidly increase in cortisol level. Later on, uh, we had a partnership with NASA, with the Navy, with the Army. We have a lot of development. We have a new work coming also. We incorporate a, a series of chemical physical sens uh, sensors. We can do machine learning. We can accurately tell which type of stress it is, what is the stress score you have right now. So this work is coming hopefully soon. So very recently, we also tried to develop other sensors. They can try to monitor very low level biomarkers in our body. Important clinical relevant biomarker, as I said earlier. As they are present in our body fluid at very low concentration. For example, some proteins, like C-reactive protein, is a well-known inflammatory biomarker. So it is related, uh, you know, tell us our systemic inflammation condition. You know, many of the major leading cause of this, including heart failure, COPD, infections, these are all inflammation related. If we have a tool allowing the subject or patient to monitor their inflammation condition at home remotely, this could be life-saving. But monitor therapy is very hard. Again, okay. either invasively through blood, with a couple of with all the laboratory washing steps, or if you try to monitor this in sweat, the present in a very low concentration, pickle model level, how to monitor this automatically is highly challenging. So recently, we introduced this approach. It's actually a microfluidic strategy to allow us to monitor automatically inflammatory proteins in situ using a wireless wearable system. How this work? Still based on our laser engraved graphene, we uh, are modifying our capture antibody on the surface of our electrode. So, uh, so this is our working electrode. So in the microfluidics, when we induce sweat, we use ionophores to induce sweat. When sweat flows into microfluidics, we, in the microfluidics, we have the reagent. Actually, the detector antibody is linked to a golden nanoparticle. This is for signal amplification. And detector antibody, we also conjugated a, a redox-proof thionine, which gave us the redox potential at around negative 0.2. We don't have interferences at this potential. It gives us measurable signal. So how does this entire system work? OK, we have the video show multi-layer design. We can autonomously induce sweat through building ionophoresis module. When sweat come out, CRP come out as well. When CRP come out, it will enter microfluidics, bound to the detector antibody, you see. And everything get, uh, go with the microfluidics, then bind to the capture antibody on the working electrode. This is a sandwich uh, structure formed here. That sweater will continuously flow, wash away all the excess amount of reagent. So eventually, we are doing detection in a clean sweat matrix. So we are conjugating, we are detecting how much redox proof left on the electrode, on the detector antibody. Then we quantify how much CRP. We also build in pH sensor, temperature sensor, and ionic stress sensor to perform real-time sensor calibration to mitigate the influence from personalized variation in general. So in collaboration with a multiple clinician and is involved or institute involved, we have evaluated our technology on smokers, non-smokers, COPD patients and different type of heart failure patients and patients with sepsis, with COVID infection, acute infection, and even long COVID. We did 80 subjects here. We found pretty good correlation between sweat and serum CRP level. And we can identify elevated CRP level in all these major health conditions. Means this technology could be used for remote inflammation monitoring. During the COVID, that's still back two, three years ago, we also applied at that time, the whole institute shut down. You can only work on something related to COVID. So our student, uh, two brave girls actually stayed in the lab, developed a technology based on our sweat sensor technology, but this is not about sweat sensor. So we built a SARS-CoV-2 rapid plex. This is a telemedicine platform, still based on our laser engraved graphene. They can simultaneously monitor virus energy, virus antibody, and inflammatory biomarkers, all in one within 10 minutes in, uh, in both saliva and blood. Simultaneously monitor all these uh, biomarkers can tell us three aspects of infection, whether we are currently infected, whether uh, you know, how is our immunity information based on antibody, 
and how severe the infection is. So we can get a quantitative information very efficiently. This is just an extension application of our biosensing technology. The last part of my talk, I want to introduce how can we power future wearables. We talk about the applications a lot already. Again, we need a more powerful functionality for wearable sensor. That means also higher power consumption. So usually we are using a small rechargeable lithium battery to power most of our prototypes. But again, people always ask how your power consumption, can you harvest energy? You know, one of the main features we believe, if we can harvest energy from the human body or from the surrounding environment, this will be very attractive for future wearables. So since we are doing sweat sensor, the first idea coming to our mind is sweat contains a lot of chemicals. Can we use chemicals in sweat to power our sweat sensor? So this comes to the concept of biofuel cell. So here we introduced a biofuel cell powered wearable sensor. Using this enzymatic biofuel cell, they can convert chemicals in human sweat into electricity. And we did an interesting development to get very high power. This allow us for the first time demonstrate the battery free biofuel power system that can perform multiplex sensing, signal processing, and the Bluetooth wireless communication, not using any battery, entirely powered by sweat. How we can do that? Biofuel cell, we are not the first one to do that. Again, usually but have two limitations. One is power is low, the other one is stability is low. So we address both problem. Firstly, how to enhance the power. Using different type of nanomaterial in a bio anode, we are using 3D nickel structure coated with graphene and coated with CMT. So this increased the electrocatalytic surface area by 3,000 times. On the uh, cathode side, we are using platinum cobalt decorated CMT which give us a pretty high surface area as well. So overall, we can get an untreated human sweat up to 3.6 milliwatt per centimeter square. Very small area, we can get several milliwatt continuously. And even for the subject contain less lactic acid in their sweat, we can still get close to two milliwatt per centimeter square. This is the reason we can power the entire system without using any battery. So we also address the long-term stability issue of these biofuel cells. We realize usually the limited lifetime is because of limited lifetime of the cathode. People typically use platinum as a cathode, but platinum is very bad in case of anti falling. Uh, for example, this platinum electrode cathode, the onset potential drops dramatically within one hour in sweat, you see. And performance decays so quick. And instead of platinum here, we are using transient metal cobalt dopant to make the platinum cobalt alloy. This can enhance the cohesive energy and stabilize the nanoparticle. That give us very good stability. You see platinum nanoparticle uh, is very bad. Platinum cobalt is much better in case of maintaining performance in the body fluid. And if we couple this with another anti-folding film, this is a primer selective nephin film, we can get a very stable performance of this cathode over long-term operation. Here you see many uh, two star in the scans and 15 hour, another 15 hour. The performance remains stable over long-term operation. So by using this battery-free system, uh, we, can, we can package the system using PDMS, uh, only one side attached to the skin through medical adhesive. So we can continuously collect you know, ammonia, urea, glucose, pH, these are some example biomarkers from our daily activity. So it's pretty uh, low power, cell power already. Working together with Aziti Imami is our IC design expert, Kate, also our chair of electrical engineering. She designed this IC chip that can be used to power management. So overall, the system is, the chip is only 1.06 by 1.32 millimeter. So packaged together with our biofuel cell is only 5.5 by 6.2 millimeter. So this can provide cold start, stable power output, and uh, overall, the system is very small. You can imagine this can be used to miniaturize our entire wearable system. We have another uh, project uh, right now. We are doing tap out very shortly, uh, supported by ONR, is try to develop a system with integrated circuit that can simultaneously handle 15 to 20 sensor channels, including energy harvesting, energy management, multiplex, all module sensor modality operation, plus wireless communication in a single chip, so it will be very small. So we, not only we can harvest energy from our human sweat, we can also 
uh, harvest energy from human body motion. In this case, we are using triple electrical nano generator, not something new uh, in case of the concept here. And we are using a flexible PCB based freestanding triple electrical nano generator. It's based on commercial PCB technology, highly robust. They can convert the mechanical energy into electricity in this case. So using this, we can also have, uh, convert the mechanical energy during our data activity into electricity, allow us to demonstrate multiplex sensing, signal processing, and the Bluetooth-based wireless communication without using any battery. But again, this is not very convenient to implement. You have to do vigorous activity to get power. This power is not continuous, it's based on pulse. So to address this problem, People also ask, what if I don't have sweat to start with, or, you know, can we get a cell power system without doing vigorous activities to start? So very recently, we proposed new technology using ambient light to power this wearable system. In this case, because light is available everywhere, outside we have strong sunlight, even the indoor we have this artificial light. Can we harvest energy from the light? Ideally, even weak indoor light. Here we are using a proboscide solar cell. It's a flexible uh, PSC in the case of, uh, solar cell. We showed that this solar cell record breaking power efficiency over, over 31% under weak indoor light. So this, uh, this uh, uh, platform is very powerful. This allows us to demonstrate battery-free system, only powered with a very small solar cell on the skin. And we can do ionophoresis, power ionophoresis to locally induce sweat and to power multi-modal sensor measurement, including amplimetric sensing, potential metric sensing, voltammetric sensing, and NPD metric sensing simultaneously, and powering Bluetooth wireless communication. So this is our solar cell. It's flexible and pretty high power, even under weak indoor light, as I said. And we did a very good packaging to make sure it's biocompatible, because people have a concern with provides guard solar cell toxicity in general. So with a very good pa packaging, this solar cell has highest power conversion coefficient under indoor light, which is our goal. We don't want to always stand on the very strong sunlight to do power something that's useless, essentially, right? We want to do the real life ambient light. In this case, we can monitor, for example, glucose, pH, sodium, even sweat rate, and uh, temp temperature as well and across activity from morning to the evening uh, on the different uh, uh, illumination conditions. And you may also ask, what if I don't have light, right? How about at night? This is the battery-free system. Imagine you can have a very, very tiny battery. We also demonstrate that with a very tiny battery, we don't need to really use the external source to charge the battery. Entire day, you can use sunlight to power and, or, or, or indoor light. This light will charge that small battery in the whole night. We can power the entire night, the battery will not even have notable voltage drop. So that means actually this is a fully sustainable system. You can really um, power the wearable system for long term in different type of conditions. This is about uh, uh, our ambient light power system. Uh, last but not least, uh, we are not only working on sweat sensor, we have many other activities going on, and we are doing other body fluid as well, and this year we published the work also we developed this wearable sensor, which is also called a smart bandage, that can perform chronic wound monitoring. You know, chronic wound uh, is a major uh, concern for the, our society. Uh, there is a huge financial burden for the patient in general. So we developed this uh, smart bandage that can perform multiplex monitoring. They can monitor ammonia, pH, temperature, uric acid, lactate, glucose. This is the inflammatory and a metabolic monitoring system. This smart band can do more than monitoring. They can also do combination therapy through electrical stimulation to facilitate the tissue regeneration. They can also do drug delivery to deliver the anti-inflammatory and, and microbial drugs. So overall, this multiplex sensing and combination therapy can potentially serve as a closed loop system. We have evaluated this in, <coughs> in the animal models, including mice and rats. We can monitor this metabolic process when they get an infection, after treatment, or different dietary intake, you can see how this biomarker level change in real time. And we also evaluated our combination therapy compared to if you don't do any treatment in a combination therapy, or you only do the one type of treatment using drug or using electrical stimulation. The combination therapy really accelerates the wound closure much faster. And uh, this is, uh, we actually right now, evaluated the newer generation of our smart bandage in human subjects already. 
So to summarize, uh, we have demonstrated this wearable chemical sensing platform. This really allows us to monitor broad spectrum biomarkers from our skin continuously, not all continuously, but non-invasively in our daily activities. This chemical information is not previously accessible, and we could couple this with physical information as well. We can apply this to many healthcare applications, including prevention, uh, disease management, and again, biomarker discovery. So in the end, I would like to thank my research group. Uh, my, one of the two members did uh, most of the work. Um, and also our clinical collaborators to evaluate our technology and some engineering professors as well to develop newer systems. And lastly, our funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions. Um, I was just curious about, um, so all your work is focused on dermal sensors. Um, I saw in Joseph Wang's publications uh, mm -hmm. that he's been at least very interested in uh, the microneedle sensing uh, mm -hmm. approach. What are your thoughts on using mm -hmm. that approach for these types of applications, especially monitoring uh, analytes from the blood? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think. Uh, uh, out of sweat, I would say interstitial fluid is another attractive body fluid. But of course, there is also more challenges. Uh, it's already not non-invasive. With a micro needle inserted in the body, there is more concerns about the safety, uh, long-term operation, and uh, of course, uh, you know, not everything is easy to go below the skin. You have very limited area to do chemical sensing. That's why so far the micro needle technology in the human subject, uh, I think probably one demonstrated, still limited to a few target: glucose, lactate, alcohol. I think those high concentration target. In the low concentration, is not easy, and again, more safety regulation. But of course, it has its own benefit because it's below the skin. It probably has a higher accuracy reflecting blood. I think a person counts in both aspects, but I think sweat has the advantage of being non-invasive, has a lot more room in case of material, by compatibility, and how acceptable people use in their daily activity. It was a really interesting talk, so I was wondering, can you talk more about how the safety issue of the biofuel and the solar cell integrated biosensors have been addressed? Because mm -hmm. some common problems of them include uh, lead leakage or any material degradations. Would this be concerning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. So definitely when we do all the biosensors for human application, biocompatibility is always a priority to concern, right? Mm -hmm. So the good thing is, uh, most of our material, I would say nearly all the material we use in our uh, sensor part, even biofuel therapy, they are biocompatible, like either based on carbon material or based on some enzyme. And another part that we try to mini mitigate, even this potential risk, is everything is in the microfluidic. It's not like uh, you put a chemical directly facing the skin. So they are sealed in the microfluidic. Sweat enter only from the microfluidic flow inside. So chemicals will not really have leakage uh, or direct contact with the skin. And again, all the chemicals we try to make it biocompatible already. And regarding the ProviseGuard solar cell, it's attractive in case of performance, but again, ProviseGuard people have a concern about uh, packaging. So we indeed uh, paid a lot of attention in packaging. So we tried to uh, evaluate the lead, uh, uh, for example, uh, leakage from the ProviseGuard, even during the extreme mechanical uh, bending uh, or deformation, or even we did a cell culture study, it's fully biocompatible based on our packaging. It would be like a lithium battery. People have a concern about safety. People still use it in a wearable application for the battery aspect. But, but really for the sensor side, they are fully biocompatible. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I'm really interested in the, um, you described them as engraved artificial antibodies. And yes. uh, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, you know, how new are those as an idea? Um, what what problems do they solve that, that mm -hmm. antibodies typically have? Mm -hmm. I know that one that, um, was an issue in my field was that if you if you freeze the antibodies and then defreeze them, you know mm -hmm. they don't work as effectively. And then also what the the sensitivity and specificity of them mm -hmm. could be. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Molecule printed polymer, the concept is not new. Again, biosensor in general, most concept itself is not new. But what's new is really engineering aspect, how to apply this in situ to automatic detection. People even, no matter for anybody for molecule printed polymer, you could recognize target, do a lot of bench top washing steps to do the detection in the redox proof. I mean, redox solution could be like fair cyanide, for example. So that is a problem. They're not working in situ. So we incorporated, you know, artificial uh, antibody development, even redox probe on the graphene electrode, how to regenerate sensor to make them work in situ. I think artificial antibody has an advantage, of the disadvantage firstly. They're not as selective as natural antibody, certainly. But again, natural antibody, the choice is very limited. It's not like everything we can find in natural antibody, right? That's why artificial uh, antibody is very attractive in this aspect. It has more benefit in case of stability. We should, uh, that can even work uh, under 80 degrees C, 90 degrees C, because they are based on polymer. Depending on which polymer you're choosing, they can work on the extreme conditions that may be more attractive, we think, for, uh, we talk with JPL, you know, no matter for Earth or for uh, space exploration, could be more attractive. And another aspect is regarding selectivity. I already showed, it's complicated because people report mixed results could be because of choice of this material, how to design that to give you better selectivity. We even design this computational or systemic approach to help us to design, to facilitate the optimization of the polymer. I would say it is tricky, require more work to optimize, to get the best performance artificial antibody. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you so much for your talk. So how do you find the biomarkers? Are you conducting a separate research to find the biomarkers for different targets, or uh, what is the process? Uh, I think there are two ways. Firstly, you know, there are some famous ones we all know. We search from literature, like cortisol to stress, glucose to diabetes. Those with we don't need other people educate us so we can find, we easy to convince people as well. This is what we do uh, in some aspect. In other, the other aspect, we always look for new biomarkers. And in the meantime, we have a lot of discussion with our clinical collaborators. Very often, I found a collaborator or a collaborator found me, I propose something, they said, we don't care this, we care this, can you do this, you know? It's always fun, uh, mutual interest, I think. Uh, we know from literature, but literature doesn't really mean clinical value. So we found a good balance. They feel excited, we are also feel excited that we develop a sensor and evaluate uh, uh, on the patient. We, but we always try to have a plan first. Can we find a patient? Can we find the right health condition to test? Not only develop a sensor. So always uh, because of translation, we want to show what's next after you have a sensor. Yeah, that's uh, really uh, working closely with the clinician is very important. In the meantime, as I said, there's a new field for biomarker discovery, right? If we can monitor more things, we don't even exactly know we know they are important, for example, stress. Oh, glucose is even important for stress. You know, glucose is a very known stress biomarker, but doesn't really tell exact stress level. AI, machine learning will tell. So when we monitor more things reliably, collect data, multi-model, we apply machine learning, we can identify more specific role of this biomarker. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for a great talk. Could you talk about the material and geometry choices that went into the um, sweat stimulation electrodes? Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah. Uh, sweat stimulation electrodes, we are mostly using carbon materials. Um, people, commercial device is based on uh, like, uh, steel, actually. Um, because it, we apply small current, skin impedance could be high. The initial voltage load could be more than 10 volt. That's why if we use gold electrode, silver electrode, it will not work well, it will corrode, actually. That's why carbon electrode works very good. So uh, current is very small, but initial voltage load could be like 10 plus volt. Yeah, that's why so far we printed carbon, print like a laser engraved graphene, these are our best choice. And they're low cost, very stable, and uh, especially on their initial high voltage, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, can you elaborate more on the signal trans transduction method you're using? Because I heard like you're using gold nanoparticle. With, so is there like a transistor like phase uh, mm. strategy you're using or something like that, thank you. Yeah. We have some transistor work, uh, but we prefer a classic electrochemical sensor. They're really stable a long time. So we uh, mostly work using electrochemical sensors. So basically for example, enzymatic sensor, there's enzyme catalyzer reaction. By detecting if the reaction or product, basically chemical reaction give us the electron flow. For example, glucose. Glucose become gluconic acid producing hydrogen peroxide. We could either detect hydrogen peroxide or introduce a redox probe like a push and blue, detecting the redox probe signal. 
So basically, the chemical signal we are detecting is, for example, even this antibody based uh, uh, approach based on C-reactive protein. So antibody don't give us signal, but we conjugate uh, this redox molecule cyanine here on the antibody. This molecule will give us measurable signal. If you scan voltage, then we have oxidation peak or reduction peak at a certain voltage. By monitor peak changes, we know the target concentration. Now my question is like, how are you detecting this? Is it direct, like, like hydrolysis substrate? Or something? Um, uh, it, it also depends. For example, for this type of research, we scan voltage from low to high. We scan voltage. Uh, then we, we see the oxidation peak, the current. You have reaction. We are measuring reaction all the time. Either under apply a voltage to see the reaction, or sweep the voltage from with certain waveform to see the current response. So essentially, we monitor mostly by some current response from certain chemical reaction. Yeah, the real signal come from chemical reaction. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful uh, seminar presentation. And uh, can you? Explain more details about how the uh, apoptosis uh, IP uh, that your lab is using can stimulate the sweat, uh, sweat glands longer than the conventional IP. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a conventional IP, th th there are a few things. Firstly, uh, conventional IP using pyrocarbon. Pyrocarbon, this drug works okay, but it only work for really working for half an hour, or 45 minutes. I think it's very short term. That's give us. Trouble. We don't want all the time to stimulate sweat. We want a few minutes stimulation, work the longer the better. That's why we, we realize there are some other drugs. This is a couple of, firstly, it's short term. The other term is that they only work on the sweat gland right below the hydrogel, which is problematic. If you only sweat gland below the hydrogel sweating, when sweat come out, it's mixed with hydrogel. That's not desired. So we found that there are a few drugs. For acetylcholine is a naturally secreted uh, neurotransmitter. or a carbocal works good. They are not only acting the gland below the hydrogel. They are also affecting surrounding sweat gland. With the surrounding sweat gland, you can use the microfluidity to sample the newly secreted sweat from those gland. It's very clean sweat from those area. And a carbacol in particular is have like this muscanic uh, effect, nicotinic effect is affecting surrounding gland and the lasting much longer. Yeah, it works for two three days uh, for this particular drug. That's why it became our favorable, I would say, favorite choice right now for drug. Acetylcholine also works, yeah. All right, last question. What material integration and substrate strategies are you using to handle the trade-off between the ability to collect sweat on one hand and breathability, long-term adhesion, and skin irritation on the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. And since we are doing a like, skin interface sensor, we are mostly uh, right now, we don't invent some new substrate. Uh, mostly, we are using either polyimide, or medical adhesive, or SCBS, which is commonly used for flexible electronics. So right now, um, with this uh, medical adhesive, it's more like how we have this bandage work for a few days, which have no problem, because our intended usage is not really for weeks day or a few days, you easily peel it off, replace new one. And with all this existing development on this medical adhesive smart bandage technology, we did not have problem to find the material choice. But again, it, indeed, we spent a lot of time to find the best adhesive, because not all the adhesive works in a wet skin well. Especially when we are sweating, a lot of adhesive work for hour, a few hours, you feel like sweat go below the skin, not working anymore. We found a, yeah, the best choice uh, after quite a bit of time, then really allow us to put this uh, patch for the skin for a very long time, a few days operation now, <laughs> yeah. All right, we think we've run out of time, so let's uh, thank Professor Gao one more time. Thanks, everyone.